All right, we're live. Awesome. Welcome everybody to the Monday, June 5th, 2023 meeting of the Policy and Innovation Committee for the Sacramento Area Council of Governments. Um, we will go ahead and get started with the Pledge of Allegiance followed by any housekeeping items from the clerk of the board this morning. So if you please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I'll turn it over to the clerk. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and streamed over the internet, as you just heard. For members of the public viewing this meeting online, we accept and encourage public comment and have provided options that are listed at the top of this meeting agenda. For our committee members, thanks for joining us today. Please mute your devices when not speaking and use the raise hand feature in Zoom should you wish to comment. All right, and we're gonna go ahead and go to roll call. Um, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your presence. Director Desmond. Here. Davin Calvillo. Looks like she's just joining. I'm going to come back to Director Dobbin Calvillo. Uh, how to show? I'm it? here. Sorry oh, about that, everyone. No worries. <laughs> but the record show Dobbin Calvillo is present. Uh, Director, how to show? Here. Saragossa, absent. Schaefer. Here. Dollar. Here. Vang, absent. Viegas. Here. Vice Chair Burris. Here. Chair Thomas, absent. All right, we have a quorum. Awesome. All right. Well, this is the part of the agenda where we accept public communications. Any person wishing to address the committee on any item not on the agenda may do so at this time. Um, after 10 minutes of testimony, any additional testimony will be heard following the action items. Do we have any public communications at this time? Uh, there is no public comment. Wonderful. Well, with that, we can move directly into the consent calendar. Uh, all items on the consent calendar are considered routine and non-controversial in nature and can be moved on in one blanket motion. Anybody may pull an item from consent if they wish to do so. Would anybody like to pull any items from the consent calendar this morning? All right, seeing no. none, can I entertain a motion? Dowden Calvillo will move adoption of the consent calendar. Do I have a second? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, we'll go ahead and take a roll call. All right, directors, when I call your name, please indicate your vote. Uh, Director Desmond? Aye. Dowden Calvillo? Aye. How to show? Uh, Director Aye. I'm Thank you. To find a move button. <laughs> no worries. Uh, Saragossa? Absent. Schaefer? Aye. Stollard? Aye. Vang? Absent. Viegas? Aye. Vice Chair Burris? Aye. And Chair Thomas, absent. Motion carries. Wonderful. With that, we'll move into our informational items, starting with item five, the SACOG Federal Certification Review Report. And we'll turn it over to Eric. Uh, Vice Chair Burris, uh, Eric is with uh, Director Saragossa, actually, at the National Association of Regional Councils uh, in Detroit. So I'm going to take this one for him. Fantastic. Thank you, James. OK. Um, so directors, again, this is an information item, uh, but we wanted just to report on the uh, conclusion of our federal recertification. So uh, bear with me. Every four years, um, we as the federally designated metropolitan planning organization for the six counties have to get recertified. Uh, uh, there were some of you that engaged in that process, especially board leadership and Chair Kennedy and Vice Chair Saragossa. It's a pretty intensive process. Uh, it can get fairly technical, uh, but the, the, the headline here is uh, we have come through that. Uh, the federal staff from Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration were here on site uh, in March for a couple of days. Uh, they interviewed uh, board members, partners, um, they held some public hearings, and we've come out of that um, with a recommendation to be recertified, um, which, is, which is great. We have uh, no corrective actions, which is fantastic. Uh, we do have a couple of recommendations, uh, which we are going to act on. And we also got a couple of commendations. Um, so just um, uh, in terms of recommendations, I just wanna, let me just pull them up here for a quick sec. And they are in your report. Um, Sorry, I've got to find the yes, I was going back to the, the original ones. Um, 
Okay, so the first recommendation is around, um, actually very much relates to our upcoming long range plan, we're calling the blueprint, uh, which is um, our federal partners are increasingly um, uh, looking over our assumptions for future revenue sources. This is very, very germane, uh, given potential sales taxes and revenue me measures in Sacramento County and Placer County, along with others. Um, so we have to we have to do a long range plan that is uh, that is financially constrained is the term of art, um, and we have to. Uh, provide, and we're working, believe me, with uh, Sacramento Transportation Authority and PCTPA to do just this, but we're going to have a, I think, a higher level of scrutiny on any kind of future revenue sources, uh, really in the, with the goal of, um, of, of fiscal constraint. Um, we had another recommendation around our MOU with our transit operators, which should not be a problem. Uh, and then we had another recommendation for our um, interagency consultation process, which um, I think we're going to keep working a little bit with our federal partners on this one because we want to make sure we're not creating a, another level or sort of venue when we have a, um, what we call a regional planning partnership. But we think we can uh, we can we can definitely get there with that one. And then um, just in terms of our our commendations, uh, one in particular I just want to mention because your staff deserves a lot of credit was a lot of our public engagement process, both I think in terms of what we've been doing more recently, but what we're trying to establish with the board around our Engage and Power Implement Program, uh, public, participa public participation around the upcoming Blueprint Plan. So again, uh, in conclusion, um, uh, we are we're being recommended for recertification. We have no corrective actions, uh, very positive review overall. Um, and the uh, staff from Federal Highway Administration actually wants to come to the board meeting on June 16th uh, next week to also uh, make some brief remarks. So with that, just want to thank uh, all of you who were engaged in this. And I just really want to thank our staff as well, who worked really hard to give our federal partners everything they needed to complete the recertification. Congratulations. Yep, congratulations, well done. It's a reflection of your leadership, James. No, thanks, directors. Like I like I said, there's a a lot that uh, a lot that of, of effort that our our staff put into this. Uh, so, um, and I think we've um, we've we've actually developed a, a closer relationship with our federal partners through the last corrective action, as we have with our with our RTPA partners in Placer and El Dorado as well. So. That concludes my report. Again, it'll be this item will be on the agenda for the full board next week, and we'll have a staff person from the Federal Highway Administration uh, Regional Office here in person. Thank you, James. Do we have any questions from the board on this item? Anyone want to follow up with anything? No, no questions. Just uh, uh, again, I wanted to echo the comments of my colleagues that we really appreciate the hard work that went into this, and congratulations. Yeah. You beat the nitpickers. <laughs> I know that's really outstanding. I mean, that's that's a very hard thing to do. <laughs> so well, it, yeah, and I and I will say that you know, and if some of you again have we've gone through the corrective action on the sub allocation issue, which if you're in a place for El Dorado, you know, you you went through this the trenches with us on it, and I, um, it's it's I don't have to probably tell you this. It's you know, it's there are more expectations on agencies like ours. To, to perform, to have meaningful partnerships, to spend money well, right? Um, more, more expectations. And um, so I'm glad we, came, glad we came through this with such a positive recertification. Wonderful. Well, with that, I think we can go ahead and move to item six, our federal advocacy update. Hi, thank you. Christina Locke, Director of Government and Public Affairs. Um, today, we are going to be hearing from both of our lobbyists, our state lobbyists, as well as our federal lobbyists, to get updates on what's happening in Sacramento and D.C. So we're first going to start with the state in Sacramento um, with Chris Lee and Kiana Valentine at Political Group. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I don't know why there's so much glare. There we go. Uh, looks more normal now. Um, it's that time of year when I have a really hard time remembering what's happened um, since we last briefed you. I believe that was the May 8th. And so uh, since that time, we've had a lot of updates on our sponsored bill as well as state budget. 
Um, and the governor has introduced a package of legislation related to streamlining infrastructure permitting. So I was going to cover those three things in broad strokes and then um, see if there's any questions that you have for us this month. Um, so starting off, uh, AB 350, the sponsored bill related to the timing of the next, next RTP SCS update, passed off the assembly floor on consent uh, at the end of May. We are now over in the Senate, where we've been referred to two policy committees for hearing. First, the Senate Committee on Transportation. We expect that will happen about, uh, I think, on their June 28th hearing. And then we're doubled to the uh, Committee on Environmental Quality, where we expect to be heard uh, in early July, probably uh, July 5th. Um, so, so far, haven't had uh, any no votes in the legislature looking to continue on that pathway. Um, we've already reached out to those policy committees in the Senate and had some productive conversations. Continue to talk to the Air Resources Board about some transparency, some ways to integrate uh, the raise grant work that'll be part of the next SCS update uh, into the bill uh, to make sure that we're really uh, sh showing the value of the additional time that SACOG is going to have to complete the process, but optimistic that those uh, conversations will continue to go well. And so in a good place there on that bill, and I uh, would be happy to entertain any questions if there's anything on AB 350 before we turn to budget and infrastructure permitting. All right, any questions from the board on that? All right, looks like we're good to keep rolling. Great. Um, so since we last talked, uh, the governor released his May revision. We've got a pretty extensive write-up uh, in your packet on that. So I won't dwell too much on that because uh, within the next, uh, the following month, both the assembly and the Senate uh, came together with their own budget plans. And so um, talking a little bit about some of the key items from a SACOG perspective, um, the transportation and public transit operations piece of the budget is probably um, the thing that's closest um, to the sort of policies you all are working on. And uh, the Senate and the Assembly uh, both took action to reject the governor's proposed transit and intercity rail capital cuts. So if you recall, this was originally going to be two years, $2 billion each allocated out uh, amongst the regions based on a population formula. Um, the governor had proposed reducing that by $2 billion and then pushing $500 million out to two uh, future years. So instead of being 2 billion, 2 billion, it would be 1 billion, 500 million, 500 million. The legislature rejected that. And in a nod to transit and the uh, operations fiscal cliff, they both have placeholder trailer bill to allow some flexibility between that capital funding and operations needs that transit agencies around the state have. Um, they also approved fund shifts, $300 million from state highway funds to backfill the active transportation program, another $200 million from state highway funds to fund the local climate adaptation program. That's a new program. The first round um, is uh, applications are being sought right now at the CTC, and then the port and freight infrastructure program for $150 million. So that is altogether a pretty sizable shift away from state highway funds two programs that can benefit, in many cases, regional and local projects. Um, the Assembly actually also took action to reject the governor's proposal to reduce the active transportation program. As you recall, that program got a billion dollar one-time general fund allocation as part of uh, the Budget Act of 2022. Um, on housing, a little bit uh, less of differences. Uh, Senate and Assembly both approved an additional billion dollars for the Homeless and uh, Housing Assistance Program for 2023-24, uh, and an additional legislative augmentation for 24-25. So the governor has just put one year in. The legislature is indicating their desire to keep this program going and put an additional year in. Um, and then there's some slight differences between um, the legislative packages on housing. The assembly gave $150 million to the multifamily housing program um, and uh, rejected a cut to accessory dwelling units, so $50 million program. So we're basically now uh, in this sort of uh, waiting period until June 15th to see 
what the three parties here, the Senate, the Assembly, and the Governor um, will come together on this. I think the, the transit operations piece is something uh, that is continuing to attract a lot of discussion around Sacramento. Um, transit advocates are viewing that option to shift that population-based transit capital funding as insufficient. They've been looking for a $5 billion package spread out over five years. Uh, this is a much more uh, modest proposal. And so there's also ideas floating around about, do we take unrestricted cap and trade revenues? Is there additional federal transportation money that's flexible that could be shifted from highway purposes to transit purposes? Um, and, and so forth. And so um, that is one major sticking point that we think will be resolved, um, hopefully within the next uh, you know, two weeks. Um, I'll stop there, see if there's any questions. Again, there's a lot here um, in terms of the, the moving parts. Oh, one last thing I will um, highlight for you because it's relevant to some of SACOG's broader priorities um, is in the May revision, the governor proposed a series of cuts to programs that were you know, intended to mitigate impacts of climate change in communities. He proposed instead funding $1.1 billion worth of those cuts in a future resources bond. Um, as you recall, the governor's already put a proposal on the table, although not with a lot of legislative language or detail, uh, to bond against some mental health services funding and create these campus environments for, for treatment. Um, so this is really the second bond issue where he's said uh, the administration is interested in proceeding in this discussion, looking at resources and, and sort of climate resiliency as a second area. There's a ton of other bond bills out there, a lot of discussion, a real lack of clarity about what the legislature might coalesce around. We've got housing, homelessness, veterans, resources, water, flood, uh, climate resiliency, housing, all of those are under consideration in the legislature. And there's a lot of discussion about what might go on the 2024 ballot, entertaining the idea of March primary ballot versus November general election. And so we want to continue to monitor, especially the resources bond discussion to see if there's opportunities to advance some of the climate friendly infrastructure priorities that SACOG has. So I'll pause there and Kiana, do you wanna talk a little bit about the governor's infrastructure permitting package? But in the meantime, see if any questions on budget. Any questions from the board? All right, I'm not hearing any, so we can go ahead and keep rolling. Okay. Um, Thanks, Chris. I just wanted to update folks a little bit about the governor's infrastructure package that he released just over a week and a half, two weeks ago now uh, at the site of a future solar wind farm in uh, Stanislaus County. Uh, he signed an executive order and then released 10 legislative proposals proposed to be implemented as budget trailer bills. Um, related to a number of things meant to accelerate infrastructure development projects ranging from transportation to energy to water. Uh, there are uh, a number of them that apply to issues of importance to SACOG, although I will say these are mostly focused um, at state level projects and or the number of projects across the state is pretty limited. Uh, so there are a couple of measures related to uh, CEQA streamlining, primarily um, administ the preparation of the administrative records, and then judicial streamlining uh, that we've seen applied to projects here in Sacramento, like the Golden One um, Center. Uh, those would be applied um, across a variety of different types of infrastructure projects if the legislature agrees to the package and there is a deal in the next um, couple of weeks. There are um, NEPA delegation authority measures uh, for permanent NEPA delegation for transit projects. There's um, job order contracting and progressive design build for Caltrans and water projects. There's some other uh, Delta related matters and then uh, fully protected species classifications, reclassifications. Uh, and then accelerated environmental mitigation. Uh, so collectively, the governor has been trying to propose this again as part of the state budget process. 
Uh, but in the last week and a half, as the legislative budget committees met uh, and their subcommittees met to review the May revise, uh, they essentially kicked it back to policy committee. Uh, so today, the Assembly Transportation Committee meets, and then two other Assembly Policy Committees are meeting uh, tomorrow and Wednesday, and then the Senate is meeting uh, to get those proposals through the Policy Committee process. Um, it is unclear to me uh, the legislature's appetite for passing uh, one or more or the package of these um, uh, infrastructure acceleration proposals, but I can tell you the governor's office is incredibly focused on getting this done as part of um, as part of the budget. I was on a call late Friday afternoon and they had you know just hundreds of stakeholders trying to rally support um, from local and regional governments, private sector, unions, business, environmental organizations, et cetera. Uh, so Chris and I haven't had a chance to talk about this, and this was after our last meeting with SACOG staff, uh, but there is an opportunity if SACOG were to want to weigh in on this. Um, I think the governor's office is actively looking for support uh, for these proposals, so that uh, option is before you all, of course. Chris, uh, let me know if I missed anything. I think that is the latest as it stands this morning. Happy to answer any questions as well. Yep, thanks so much. Again, uh, happy to answer any questions and thanks for the opportunity to present. Anything so, from the board? Oh, go ahead. So yeah, just a quick question. Thank you, you guys, for the, for the update. I, I know things are moving pretty quickly in this infrastructure acceleration. I know they are putting a lot of pressure in interesting places to sort of garner support for these uh, ledge proposals. Kiana, is this, I mean, I, I, it sounds like you're still struggling trying to get a sense of kind of how much appetite the legislature has for it, because there's so much in there. It seems as though it's all been sort of tangled by design to sort of everybody gets a little bit of something, but nobody gets everything kind of thing. It's that whole sort of approach. Um, is it your sense at all, or maybe it's too early to sort of prognosticate on a, in a crystal ball, but is there is there likely going to be aspects of this infrastructure package sort of pulled out in, in earnest, or is it likely to be something where, you know, certain members can't vote in certain parts, so they sort of peel it off to then have a side vote so they can, you know, create that kind of token vote to vote no on areas where they would seem be seen as sort of not supportive of areas that are more politically challenging, or is it or what's your sense of that, or is there any any, or is it too soon? I'll see if Chris agrees or disagrees in real time with me, Supervisor. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I have a really good sense of of how this unfolds. We may know better this afternoon after the Assembly Transportation Committee meets, and we're able to see the first um, sort of vetting in a policy setting. Um, what I'm interested to see is there is a lot of pressure in the Senate to solve the transit operations um, funding crisis, particularly in the Bay Area. Uh, there, the May Revise nodded to support for a solution, but did not go so far as to put something on the table. So I'm curious, does this get leveraged uh, by the Senate, by the Assembly, as part of the overall budget construct? To me, that's where I um, just, from a gut perspective, could see this to, could see this going. I don't know if that is helpful at all, but I, I think it is a little well, early to say. And then maybe Chris has any thoughts too. Yeah, I was just gonna say I think there's kind of diffuse benefits, right? Like you know, if you really look at this from a SACOG perspective, a couple of the CEQA pieces could conceivably be helpful. If you have a big transportation project where you think you're likely going to go to court and it meets the cap tie principles and it gets nominated and it's one of 10 that's selected, you know, you could conceivably have a shorter litigation window if feasible, right? Um, and then some of the other items just really, you know, so, and that's the same for every stakeholder, right? Like there's, there's some folks who might be involved in building a lot of these different types of projects, but you have kind of diffuse benefits across these 10 bills. And I think as Kiana said, it's going to really come down to how high does the administration want to prioritize this? And is the legislature trying to, for instance, on the transit operations piece, going to try to use this as a bargaining chip, right? So I, I think it's a it's an interesting um, conundrum. It's sort of an odd process now that we're you know we're we're 
doing informational hearings and policy committees and, and the, the legislature basically said this is you didn't send it to us as part of the may, re may revise it's not a traditional trailer bill and so it we're, it's a very odd process but i think we'll see it we'll see it um some horse trading with it um a lot of the environmental opposition because of the way it was introduced has been really focused on process but I think, you know, you saw Restore the Delta come out with a really strong statement against the DWR or the um, right. Delta piece, um, as well as some other groups with substantive concerns. So yeah. um, unusual yeah. process for sure. For sure. They were very helpful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Wonderful. Are there any other questions? All right. Seeing none. Thank you, Chair. I think now we'll move to our federal lobbyist, Jason Pavlicek, to give us an update on what's going on in D.C. Thank you very much, Christina. I'm going to try to share my screen here. I have a few slides uh, which summarize what was included in your packet, I believe. Uh, and let me go ahead and change the view here. Uh, by the way, I believe you, you all know who we are, uh, Jason Pavlchuk, uh, Devin Barnhart. You usually hear from my colleague, Devin. She's certainly the more presentable of the two of us, um, but she recently had a, a brand new baby girl um, and is is um, uh, going to be uh, out for a little while, but everyone is healthy and happy. Uh, oh, congratulations to her. I will extend that to her, absolutely. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the fiscal cliff, not the, the transit fiscal cliff. We've got to come up with a better name, I think, at all levels to describe these emergencies. Um, there's there's always cliffs. I feel like sometimes I'm on a TV show, Twin Peaks. But uh, the fiscal cliff here uh, that is a little more uh, wide encompassing uh, a deal was uh, set in stone, put in place. Uh, and I think we had 72 hours before complete and utter economic devastation took place. So we're getting better um, to have that that full 72 hours. Um, but a couple of impacts on the transportation side uh, that I want to uh, uh, sort of go through for your, your consideration. Um, I think all in all, uh, the way uh, the fiscal cliff legislation came through um, was a, a pretty positive thing in, in terms of transportation funding. Uh, a lot of things that were on the table um, were eventually taken off. Uh, one of the things that I will note is that one of the big uh, clawbacks, one of the big victories that that Republicans had in the fiscal cliff legislation is a rescission of unspent COVID relief funding. If you recall, there were uh, four or five different spending packages that were a part of uh, the COVID relief package, CRISA, CARES, uh, I'm not going to go through all of the names, but uh, from that, there was a lot of spending uh, that was left uh, unspent. Uh, most of it, for the most part, uh, in the healthcare industry where, where funding was allocated uh, and expected to be spent, but was not. But there was a significant amount of transportation funding um, that was, was made available to help transit agencies and uh, state DOTs. Uh, in particular, about 65 billion uh, federal transit funds and about 10 billion in uh, uh, federal highway dollars. Uh, the rescissions uh, only impacted uh, and rescissions is, is, a, is a cute word of taking back the money, only impacted the highway portion. Uh, of the $10 billion that were included in the CRISA bill, about $2.2 billion will be returned uh, to the federal treasury. Uh, they were left unspent. Uh, basically, any funding that was left, what's, what's known as unobligated, meaning that it is not already directly in, in sort of the chain of, of being ready to be spent, um, was rescinded. Uh, in the last three weeks, Caltrans um, did an extraordinary job working with federal highways to obligate funding that would have been rescinded. It's my understanding that they got through um, a lot of, of funding in the last days here uh, that for projects to approve them, get the funding obligated and clear it. Um, it it's my understanding that California will see several hundred million of funds be rescinded, but that was closer to about a billion um, a, a few days ago um, in terms of how much money would have been rescinded. So that is a huge benefit to California is that the state was able to, to um, uh, obligate so much of that, that money. And a lot of that is, is paperwork, but usually that paperwork takes a lot of time. So 
Um, you know, in terms of, of, of the fiscal cliff, the biggest impact was on the highway side and from California's purposes, uh, that, that impact was in many ways mitigated. Uh, what is not included in uh, the, the rescissions for FTA funding. As I mentioned, there were about $65 billion through the varying co uh, uh, COVID relief packages that were made available to transit agencies. Of that 65 billion, there was only about 3 billion left unobligated, much of that uh, in small and rural transit agencies, um, not exclusively, but that's where most of the money was. Uh, so Republicans decided uh, that they didn't need to go after that funding since it was really their own constituencies that would have been impacted. So in terms of clawing back any of the old CARES money, any of the old CRISA money, uh, again, it only applies to federal highways, not to federal transit. One of the things that we were very worried about through this uh, uh, fiscal cliff package was that funding that was planned to be spent through either IIJA, which is also transportation reauthorization, bipartisan infrastructure package, however you want to frame it, um, the most recently passed Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which was the big climate package that Democrats did through budget, budget reconciliation, or the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act. None of the programs <clears throat> authorized or appropriated through those three bills will be impacted. In fact, the way they develop the legislation in the future, if the next Congress decides to rescind funding or cut funding from those programs, the way this bill was written, those cuts would have no budgetary impact. So there is no fiscal incentive um, for Republicans or, or Democrats for that reason, or for any future Congress to cut the funding that was already authorized through IIJA, the Infrastructure Inflation Reduction Act or Chips and Science Act. What that means in English is that all of the funding that SACOG is expected to get through CMAC, planning funding, uh, STBG, um, all the money that uh, the transit agencies are supposed to receive, that is solidified and then solidified again. That was not always the case. There were discussions at one point that some of the cuts would come through <coughs> mandatory, mandatory cuts in those programs. So it is a huge, huge, huge win for infrastructure that the gains we made in the past three years will not you know, uh, 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 be stepped back. <clears throat> that being said, they did include two years of budgetary caps. Um, the way the legislation is written, and, and if you read, if you read the Democrats' version um, of, of description of this legislation, and you read the Republican version, you think they're talking about two very different bills, um, and that's largely because the way the budget caps were set are very, um, there are loopholes created, we'll, we'll say that, um, in terms of, of how you could discuss the budgetary caps, but, but what you know, what is in place, what the impact is, is that the non-defense federal spending that is considered discretionary um, will remain capped at FY 2023 levels. In fact, it'll be reduced by about 5%. Um, that does not include, that funding does not include, for example, IIJ funding. Those are walled off outside of the caps, right? So all of that funding that was already promised and is forthcoming, they are not considered for these purposes to be to count against the discretionary caps. <clears throat> so what you'll see and what the impact is for defense and housing and transportation is that some of the extras that have been put in over the years that often comes in the form of more money for some of the uh, competitive programs that often comes in the form of more formula dollars for highway or more formula funding for transit. That is what will be impacted. The extras in transportation will likely be tougher to come by. I, I bring that up, especially here in this regard, because as part of the, the last presentation discussing the, the, the transit fiscal cliff that not only California faces, but many other large uh, and small transit agencies alike, there is unlikely to be, and I even hesitate say, say, hesitate to say there's almost no chance there will be a fiscal bailout for transit and transit agency when it comes to operating costs. Um, that is, is very clear at this point. The, the political winds would have to change dramatically 
for there to be some type of bailout at the federal level. The most agencies can expect would be the allowance of using existing formula dollars for operating purposes. And I think even that would be um, tough to achieve given this political climate. So um, the extra money that has that usually come in the past on top of, of the formula dollars um, will be tougher to come by, uh, especially with housing. Um, the, the way Congress breaks up their legislation, it's all broke up on these 13 subcommittees. Um, and each subcommittee then has its own budgetary number that it's allowed to spend. A lot of uh, transportation is grouped with housing. And a lot of the, the, the budgetary resources that come from that bill stem from or generate from federally backed mortgages that are then repaid uh, through Fannie, uh, Fannie Mac and, and, and Freddie Mae through housing. Um, because of the raise of, in, uh, of, of the interest rates, uh, there's going to need to be actually more investment in some of those programs to backfill some of the economic resources, rather than that sort of being, for lack of better words, a profit center for the housing and transportation bill. So that's sort of another log in the fire that some of the extras that we've come to enjoy over the last few years will not be appreciated, will not come to fruition in this year or next year. But again, now we've got a larger infrastructure bill that you know one would hope would, would address many of the needs that we have from a transportation standpoint. So that is that is really all that will be impacted in terms of of the federal fiscal cliff. Um, I will say that the 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 extension runs two years, so past the 2024 election, uh, and the budgetary caps are only for two years. After that, there are discretionary targets which have no legislative or legal ramifications. But again those uh, caps and then um, uh, the, the current fiscal cliff deal sort of expire about the same time. So I'm sure this fight will, 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 will respark two years from now. So that is the sort of the end of the fiscal cliff discussion. Before I get into some of the other updates, are there any questions about, about the fiscal cliff, the federal fiscal cliff and where it stands and what next steps are or, or what's happened? Anything from the board? All right, I'm not hearing any. Okay. Uh, my only final commentary is I think this is a very good thing for infrastructure and transportation. This definitely could have been <clears throat> way, way worse. And I think in, in, in light of the changes that could have been made and the ones that are, I think in, in many ways, we should be very, very pleased with, with the end result. Just to give a quick update on some, some green means go activities. Um, obviously uh, we are doing what we can to create a more uh, a centralized grant resource uh, of federal funds for Green Mean Go projects. Uh, we've had numerous meetings with the USDOT, e USDOT, <clears throat> excuse me, EPA, Department of Energy, et cetera. Uh, Eric and uh, his team are actually at the NARC conference right now, National Association of Regional Councils, talking with some of our colleagues, uh, you know, to speak about uh, some of the work that, that SACOG is doing uh, and organize what we're sort of lovingly calling the Coalition of the Willing. Uh, because housing, transportation, uh, electrification, decarbonization are all um, issues for many, many local and regional governments. Uh, and what we are working to do is sort of show some leadership in the work that you all have done uh, and, and group others together to make the ask so that the federal funding uh, that we are, we're looking to use uh, is a little bit more flexible um, and, and can, can cross some of the silos. Uh, and those are some things that we are working on is, is, is sort of creating uh, that federal pot. Uh, I think in general, most of the conversations we have had with um, the different agencies, DOT, HUD, housing, um, EPA, is, is, is they agree. They, they believe that green means go is um, the end result that they're looking for. Quite frankly, they want more MPOs to do what you all have done. Um, you know, what they're also recognizing is that um, the very results they crave um, may be challenged because of how federal funding is set up and that certain activities and certain projects go to one entity, other projects and funding go to another entity, and that if you really want to solve this problem, you need to sort of unify all of the grants and all of the different entities together. So we are working with them and they are beginning to look at um, what they need to do administratively 
uh, to possibly do a demonstration or a pilot program that we would would very hopefully be a part of. Um, so those conversations are ongoing, um, and we hope to have uh, a further update later this summer. Just some other notes and tidbits uh, in the transportation realm. Obviously, uh, the, the train, train, tra uh, train crash in uh, East Palestine, Ohio, that uh, created a, a very, very dangerous situation, hazardous materials and whatnot, has, has forced Congress once again to look at rail safety, in particular freight rail safety. Um, a bipartisan piece of legislation uh, put together by Senator Maria Cantwell of Washington, as well as Senator Brown, Vance, and Casey, Casey uh, from uh, Pennsylvania, as well as uh, J.D. Vance, who's from Ohio. Uh, the legislation would look at sort of common sense uh, changes to, to freight safety in terms of, of track conditions, in terms of safe operations, et cetera. Um, I, I put it more as an FYI and a summary and a link to the summary can be included uh, in your, your packet, but I believe we're going to begin to see a lot more focus on freight rail safety and rail safety in general, not just because of this accident, uh, but because of a handful of others that have occurred recently, not just in the U.S., but across the world, uh, where, where hazardous materials have been spilled and dumped and what have you, and it's creating incredibly dangerous situations for those communities. So I believe that the rest of this year, you're going to see in the transportation space, a lot of federal efforts on rail safety. Um, and, and do they expand beyond the freight element? Very possibly. Um, but but that right now seems to be the key is, is freight rail safety. Um, also of note, just want to make a notation that there are two, uh, two new grants that were announced in May. Uh, actually, there was a series of grants through the Department of Commerce that look at regional innovation and technology hubs. This was a huge part of the CHIPS Act. Uh, it's a $10 billion program uh, where they're looking at the Department of Commerce as looking at the integration uh, between innovative technology uh, and regional economic development. Uh, certainly transportation can and is a part of this. Uh, so this is of note uh, that if, if you are, uh, if your local government or if your, your jurisdiction is, is interested in finding, uh, learning more about uh, what's going on there, I can certainly talk to any of you individually, but there's links to the notices and what have you. And then also there is uh, the FY23 Public Works and Ec Economic Adjustment Assistance Grant that has come from the Department of Commerce that has helped a lot of communities um, fund public works projects to address uh, economic issues, uh, whether it be uh, man-made uh, uh, or, or um, weather-related. It has helped a uh, agencies address some of those issues. Uh, and then again, uh, you will see this a lot through this uh, government, this through this federal government. Uh, there's a $51 million ride and drive electric funding opportunity coming from the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation that looks at ways local governments can catalyze um, and support investment in, in electric vehicles. Um, this is really a, a, a public-private partnership agreement where a local government or a regional government can partner with, um, you know, a charging station, a business uh, development, what have you, to uh, you know, really focus on, on ways to encourage and expand electric vehicles, uh, including vehicle charging stations, which were an eligible resource in this program. Um, finally, I'll just sort of put this on your radar. This summer, you will see four different grant programs be announced. Um, the RAISE Mega and Rural Grants should be coming out literally any day now. Uh, and those are the large federal capital programs um, uh, somewhere in uh, the neighborhood of, of probably $5 billion uh, with those three federal programs a year. Uh, also, the, the congestion relief program, which has not yet been announced. Uh, it is my understanding that the congestion relief program, which really funds pricing, um, operational uh, improvements, TDM, things of that nature, um, that program will be released in uh, later end of Q2, early Q3. Uh, and that program is only eligible and open for uh, uh, urban areas over a million. So really there are only 51, uh, 54, I think it is now, metro areas that are eligible. Um, so that's certainly one that I would urge um, all of you to, to look at. And again, that's a regional based program. Um, so something certainly that uh, will be coming up. And then again, the Smart and Attain grants, which are more technology and innovation driven will be announced, I've been told in July. And again, they will likely be uh, announced together 
where the SMART grants are planning grants and implementation grants, and the attained grants are simply innovation grants. And that's innovative, you know, projects and from transit, active transportation, all the way down to highway signalization, things of that nature. Um, so those will be coming out in July. So with that, I will stop and feel free to take uh, any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the board? Yes, Trinity. All right, go for it. Uh, you know, we're talking a lot about rapid uh, introduction of electrical vehicles across all of our country. Uh, has anybody done anything about how we're going to deal with charging and multifamily housing? Uh, I'm not seeing anything yet. I'd certainly like to hear about that. And is, are any of these grants oriented towards helping to put those kind of facilities in place if we can do it? So the drive and elect the, the, the drive the the drive and electric um, fifty one million dollar that that's absolutely um, a program that that could be utilized uh, to to promote uh, electric charging station and multifamily homes uh, largely because it, you know in theory uh, I'm making this up here but but your community could partner with a developer um, or a, a a property manager to put in charging stations, you know, in an apartment complex in a row of townhouses where it's 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 multifamily housing rather than just simply single family homes. Um, those those programs. There's also, um, you know, the state program, the Devi program, um, which are intended to develop corridors, but it does give states the flexibility to put electric vehicle stations. Um, you know, in areas that make the most sense, which I would would think include multifamily housing um, complexes. So I think the short answer is um, not explicitly, but these funding programs are set up in a way that would allow communities to focus on those issues. And I think that is what you're going to see happen very quickly is um, because the equity is a huge calling card of, of this, this administration, you're going to see that issue, I think, come more into focus um, as these dollars get sent around. But so to answer your question, there, no, it's right now not a focus. I think it will be, but the funding could be used at a, at a granular level to focus on those issues. What I'm thinking and concerned about is most of us who drive electric charge in our own carports or garages. Uh, we just saw a new development proposed in Davis today, 264 units. That means you essentially need 264 charging stations at a minimum if people are going to charge overnight in a, who live in apartments, as those of us who live in single-family homes do. And as part of our planning in the future, we're encouraging more density and multi-family, certainly part of that. So I'm just kind of wondering at some point in time, and this is kind of for James and the team, uh, I think we ought to be de developing a uh, some kind of kit to to uh, essentially vet strategies for providing uh, charging in in multifamily residential. And I'd like to see some demonstration projects so we can see some alternatives. So, thank you, Jason. You're just letting me know the 51 million could be used for that. <laughs> Madam Chair, can I comment, please? Yes, please do. So I agree with Tom uh, in, a, in a very big way that. Um, that this is a this is a, a, a pretty big challenge and and it's and it's it's certainly I own an electric vehicle and I charge in my garage as well. I use a 220, just a, the level two charger. It's not um, not a supercharger by any way, shape, or form. Very easy to adapt. It's single phase. It's a, a much, in, in my opinion, probably less expensive than putting trying to put a supercharger in a complex like that. Uh, but certainly the devil's in the details when we start looking at some of these grants does the who sponsors it and what's the matching fund requirement all this kind of stuff is really kind of important uh, information to bring forward before we start talking about how we can fund this we need to understand what the funding mechanism is and how it works and and because quite honestly, I, I think a lot of uh, apartment complex owners uh, aren't the most uh, forward-thinking folks. We need to help them 
sort of guide them along a little. So, but yeah, uh, Jason, whatever you could do to, pro to provide some more detail than just saying, well, it's not really a focus, but there is funding available. Let's help us develop a plan here. What's the, you know, how do we get this going? Because this is, this is a pretty big concern uh, in, in the long run of, uh, look at 25% of the of citrus ice households are um, apartments. You know, that's pretty, mm -hmm. it's a, a pretty, and there's certainly other communities have a greater um, uh, you know, ratio of apartments to, uh, and, and it sounds like the, the way things are moving, uh, that's really going to be more higher density homes are going to be a bigger, bigger issue. So. That has been, and, and I, James and them haven't taken off mute, so I'll, 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 I'll come in first, and I'm sure James will, may have a comment, but it's been a part of our discussions about the green means go mentality is that your exact point of, you know, the funding going to state DOTs. State DOTs don't generally interact with property developers or apartment complex managers on a day-to-day -day basis, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's easier, I think, to say if you're going to develop a, a, a plot of land and put in 250, you know, units, you know, to, to develop the, the electric vehicle charging stations, then while you're doing it, it's a completely separate situation where you have an existing housing complex, perhaps. Um, and, and, you know, who's going to take care of the management and the maintenance of those? The, the apartment complex doesn't want to, right? Like, not without, you know. So th these are the discussions that we're having is that really, if you get down to you know, implementing a decarbonization of of of, of transportation footprint, which is what GTA is pushing for. Those granular discussions need to happen at a state, regional or local level because they're not happening at the state DOT. So, and at that point, you have the siloed funding of, you know, how do we how do we manage that? So, I think those are the conversations we're having. Um, but I'll I'll stop there. I I want to make a point too, and I'm going to be really delicate in the way I say this because I'm going to be sensitive to you know what I do professionally outside of government. I I think it's incredibly important that as we're looking at electrification, we remember that plug-in EV is not the only way to go. We need to diversify our portfolio if we want to be successful at this, and part of that portfolio diversification is including fuel cell vehicles in our models. And including fuel cell vehicles in our modeling and making that a more friendly, opportunistic ability for people to participate in that market really opens up a lot of doors for people who do live in multifamily housing, especially as we're looking at reducing parking capacity across the board in our blueprints. I, I think it's incredibly important that we remember that because if we don't have to change people's habits and how they operate their vehicles, but we make them greener, we have a really good shot at success. And there's a lot of opportunity for mobile fuel cell stations that can be moved around as needed to create these corridors. So as we're having this discussion, I just I hope everybody takes some time to maybe look at like our KISO um, broadcast daily forecast for our electricity usage and our need and our supply. Look at those details and, and then come in with the conversation of is adding additional battery chargers really the solution or is there more we could be doing? Because infrastructure is more than just that. And Madam Chair, I um, just wanted to add to the conversation. This is a really good conversation. And I think I hear this, you know, a delineation between new construction and existing, which is important, right? Because one is easier, one is you know, a little bit easier to do than the other. Tom, um, in Roseville, we have the advantage of having our own electric, and we have a residential uh, electric housing program that we're piloting. We have a, a major uh, East Coast um, senior housing uh, developer who is proposing uh, a community. Uh, I'll get you the stats, but that will be all electric and it will be all self-contained. So. I'm happy to share that with you, Tom, and uh, maybe that's of of utility. To, oh, whoop, every pun intended. Maybe that's of utility to you. So, thank you. Um, everybody's talking about electric vehicles, and not so many people are talking about charging. That's what concerns me. Uh, and I do, and I appreciate Trinity's comment. Uh, I have kind of vision we could have a 
a conduit from every apartment going to individual parking spaces so they can, on their own electric bill, pay for overnight charging. That might be complicated. Uh, or, you know, but, you know, it's basically four charging stations, six charging stations are a drop in the bucket in these large apartment complexes. So, but again, as Trace, as Trinity said, said um, the current model is we all drive to gas stations to fill our tanks. We don't get it done where we live. So, you know, but maybe there are models that require it being done offsite, but the convenience of charging onsite is something most of us appreciate when we have single family homes. So I know there's a lot more room for talk here, but this isn't necessarily the place for us. <laughs> No, this has been a great discussion. And James, I was hoping you might have uh, some input before we wrap it up. Absolutely. Um, yeah, just a, just a couple of comments. I really, um, whenever we get going on um, sort of uh, alternative fuel vehicles, uh, EVs, hydrogen, right? I, it always gets a good conversation going. People are, people are leaning in and jumping in. So just a few things to remind the board. Um, and this is a bit of a preview in some ways for what's coming in the next couple of months or through the fall. Uh, we actually have a, um, a very formal working partnership with SMUD, and this is Sacramento County, so I, I fully recognize this is just one county, but SMUD, Sacramento Metro Air District, actually covers other counties as well for some of the EV stuff and Sacramento Regional Transit. So formal MOU, formal working partnership, um, I get together with the executives um, every other month. We have staff to staff work through because in some ways the, the transition into clean uh, clean vehicles is that the, the challenge is that no one agency even owns the public side of this. Mm -hmm. it, right? it, it has to, it requires intense coordination. And, and I guess all I would say on that is just stay tuned because um, we, are, we are talking about actually trying to get at least our four agencies together with um, sometime this fall. And, 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 and so just stay tuned before I give you any more details or promise too much on that. So that's, that's one thing. And we've got a lot of exciting work going on around mobility hubs, uh, um, accelerating zero emission charging. And the other thing I will say too is, um, you know, we've won this federal raise grant. We are still trying to sign the thing and get it going across all six counties. Um, but, well, if you if you read our newsletter, uh, the gig floating car share pilot project here in the city of Sacramento left Sacramento. So we just wrote that up and interviewed people, right? Because it's all lessons learned. This is the wild, wild west. We are in startup land on all this technology and will fail more than we succeed at first. Uh, but floating car share is hard to work. Uh, what is an easier model relatively is, uh, is, is housing based EV car share for affordable housing complexes. And that is actually taking off as a way of both transitioning to EVs, but also significantly reducing the transportation costs of low income residents, right? So, and, it, and that is because it is housing based, right? It's charging at home, it's charging overnight. So there's a lot of really interesting models and nonprofits and for profits that are out there. So, so that's sort of one bucket that is coming. And then just on the hydrogen, a reminder, um, in our mega region working group with the Bay Area and San Joaquin County, we awarded a Caltrans planning grant to look at medium and heavy duty um, charging, refueling, and hydrogen opportunities across the 16 counties of Northern California. So we're just really kicking that off now, because even that, right, from, I know Vice Chair Burris, we've talked about this quite a bit uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of trucks and, you know, the I-80 corridor. Um, and, and really kind of the challenges around going electric for heavy duty. Uh, but there's some really interesting opportunities around hydrogen and around piloting hydrogen. Our region actually has an application in for a federal hydrogen hub right now. There's gonna be a, a pretty major hydrogen hub selected. We're a little bit of the long shot as we often are on that. But um, uh, anyway, so, so more stuff coming there on the mega region group and uh, working group and this, this project in terms of um, uh, zero emission heavy and medium duty that we'll be reporting back to the board on um, in the months ahead. So all good stuff. Very exciting. There's, Wonderful. Thank you, James. There's not a chat feature in here, right? So I can't. There is not. <laughs> I was going to post the link to our residential 
electrification housing program. But so that would be uh, Director Hadishad. If you want to just send that to me or uh, or Robert Tadovich cool. here, what we'll do then is we'll send that back around. So that's the way to do that. Appreciate it. Bye. Great. Wonderful. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up that item. And now we're in other business. Um, does anybody on staff or on the board have anything they would like to bring up for this part of the agenda? Vice Chair Burris, I would just say, I think, I think um, some of you for sure are registered for the June 16th Blueprint Workshop in Folsom. But if you're not, we would love to see you there. We'd love to have you. Uh, we still have some, we are filling up fast. Uh, with the capacity of 300, we're over 200 now in registrations. So we have a nice mix of elected officials, staff, and um, uh, you know community, civic organizations. But uh, if you haven't registered and, and you can attend, please do. We also have a great Youth Leadership Academy lunch celebrating five years of our Youth Leadership Academy directly following that at noon. Um, so uh, encourage you strongly to, if you haven't, register if you can for June 16th and the lunch and share that with your colleagues on your on your boards and councils. Well, thank you so much, James. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and say the meeting is now adjourned and we will reconvene next month. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thanks everyone. Yeah. Thanks everyone, bye. Bye-bye.